Julie Mellon is a San Francisco Bay Area musician and educator specializing in violin and fiddle. She is a professional violinist and Suzuki teacher in Marin. She has a studio in Sausalito and at Dominican University. She started playing violin in the Suzuki method when she was four years old and continued on to receive her Bachelor's of Music in Violin Performance at the University of Colorado and her Master's of Music in Violin Performance with an emphasis on Suzuki pedagogy at the Hart School of Music. Jennifer John was her teacher at the University of Colorado and the Aspen Music Festival for two summers. She studied violin and Suzuki pedagogy with Linda Fiore at the Hart School of Music. Julie plays classical, rock, jazz, and fiddle in many musical groups in the Bay Area. She is currently the concertmaster of Lucas Valley Chamber Orchestra. Julie plays electric fiddle in a southern rock band called Southern Comfort, often sharing guitar leads on fiddle. You can find her on several albums on iTunes, including Lyra Starr's new album, A Thousand Dreams. She leads the string section of an 18-piece jazz band, Sven and the Masterful Orchestra, that performs all over the Bay Area. Their first album was released June 1, 2019. You can find her via various websites, southerncomfortsf.com, funwithfiddle.weebly.com, violinlessonsanfrancisco.com, and on YouTube, search for Lyra Star videos, Southern Comfort videos, Sven and the Masterful Orchestra videos, or her LVCO videos. Hello. Hi. Hello there. You're friends with Joshua. How did you two get to know one another? How did we get to know one another? Somewhere in Sausalito, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I, I imagine that the first, you know, time our paths crossed was either uh, Smitty's or the No Name. Um, I believe I remember you playing open mic at the No Name. Well, hi, Julie. I'm Celine. I'm a drummer and percussionist from Calgary, Canada. Cool. And uh, we share in our set list playing um, Whipping Post, which I don't see covered very often. And so I was like, hey, <laughs> I can connect with this lady. And I also do play with a uh, violinist fusion uh, player and toured with her. Uh, her previous name was Sophie Serafino, now Sophie Armstrong. And she does a lot of some of, like, a, so, so many similar crossovers like you do, which is very cool. So I thought that I wanted to definitely get to know what you're doing and what got you doing this and Suzuki Method to start. I mean, you started Suzuki Method at age four. Yes. My mother started me at four. She, we were living in Michigan, and she saw an ad in the paper that a girl had just graduated and started a Suzuki violin program, kind of what I'm doing now. And so that interests my mom, and she signed me up, and we started, and I have not put down the violin since. And could you please explain what Suzuki is? So the method is to teach children to play by ear. So they're not reading music at first, so they start very young. And it's also a method not to create a prodigy, so say, but to teach children to play music to bring the world together. So he wanted to bring peace and happiness to the world through music, through this method. So he created 10 books. So all the kids learn out of these 10 books from all different countries and they all come together. We do Suzuki institutes all over the world and they all play together even though they can't speak the same language. So it's a pretty amazing method of teaching. So your teaching career really took off, like Suzuki method specifically, or teaching in general was what struck that passion then? So I started off in Boulder playing and performing and graduated and decided I wanted to go to grad school after studying with him for two years after college. And then that, that became my passion. And then I went to the East Coast and got a master's degree out there and then moved to California to teach at Dominican University. And I've been here since 2004. And have a studio right now of 40 children. It's pretty amazing. I started with so, three kids. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think I was gonna make it. So I was playing in lots of orchestras, doing the freeway philharmonic, they call it, going to Sacramento, Modesto, Santa Cruz, all over the place, which was fun. It was a great experience, but my passion lies in teaching and performing in my bands and being a concert mistress of my orchestra, which is amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. I miss my orchestra so much. 
Do you, does your the orchestra play a lot of the regular jazz standards with string orchestration, or is it? Uh, so I have two orchestras. The jazz orchestra, yes, we use the standards, and then the other orchestra is my classical orchestra, the Lucas Valley Chamber Orchestra. So we usually meet every Tuesday, and we still have been meeting, zooming, but we can't play together. It's impossible. That leg time sucks. It's, I know. It's actually about an eighth note apart. I figured out. Yeah. If you can play an eighth note, listen to somebody playing off with you, you can maybe play together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, have you guys done any projects, any virtual projects, where you each do recordings of something on your own and try to put that together? Southern Comfort is actually working on that right now. Um, we're actually working on playing at the same time, which we've seen done. So we're all getting the equipment that we need to plug in. So we'll like see. Like direct into the internet, you mean? Like going Firewire yeah. direct in? So we're going, yeah, I'm not sure how it's going to work, but we have some sort of box that you plug into. I don't know, I'm not very techie with all of this, so thank goodness two of my members are super techie. <laughs> um, so we're trying to figure that out. Yeah. I'm excited if we can actually do it, but... Otherwise, I know that Sven and the Masterful Orchestra were going to do an online type thing where we record separately with the metronome beat and then he'll put it all together and then that will be posted online. Because we're supposed to have a show in June, which was cancelled. So, yes. Yeah, these cancellations really hit artists hard because we're part of that gig economy. And it's not even necessarily going to come back. Like, it's not like, oh, well, you're missing your gig in May. Let's just have it and whenever things start up again. It just, this is the challenge that we face, right? It is. Are you teaching Suzuki online with your students at the moment? I am, actually. I'm doing um, Zoom and FaceTime lessons. And if they're going really well. The group lessons are a little tricky. I have about four or five kids in at a time can't really play together. We try, <laughs> but it does, it's hard. Um, it what I'm finding very difficult though is the four and five year olds. They're That's difficult in general. I just <laughs> want to tell you. I have a four year old, so I, I know. don't have children, so my students <laughs> are, are the closest I have, but they are struggling with the online Zoom thing. Big time. Yeah. yeah. But the older ones, they're doing great and they they're bored, so I hope I try and make it fun, and we do creative things, and they're learning pop music and fiddle tunes, and we're mixing it up, and they're actually progressing really well. A lot of them are taking two lessons a week, just to wow. get parents a break. So, are you guys also? Are you also doing? Do you do any improvisation through Suzuki? Other, I mean, obviously Suzuki's listen and and uh, and learn. Mm -hmm. Do you, is there a component in your teaching that inc incorporates improvisation? Because I can imagine that that's what you do with, with some of your bands, is do the improvisation okay. part. So I like to teach them blues. So we learn the blues scales, and I ask them to improvise, but most of them are not wanting to do it. <laughs> so, and I, I tell them, you know, this is something that I wasn't comfortable with either, and I started doing when I was young, and now it comes naturally. So I'm hoping that they will continue it on. We'll see. <laughs> if you could, um, could you talk about becoming a violinist at four years old? Who were your parents? What was this environment in which you were brought into? Both of my parents are lawyers, non-musicians. And in the method of the Suzuki teaching, your parent comes with you to every lesson, takes notes, and actually learns to play in the first year. So my mom would come to the lessons, and that continued on through it all. And I think when I really knew that I loved the violin and wanted to continue it on, I think I was 12, because I fought all the time through those years. I don't want to practice. Don't make me practice, and my mom forced me, which I am thankful that she did. <laughs> so was it, was it something that your mom was pushing on you for those years until you fell in love with it, or did you enjoy it? You just didn't like the having to be so professional about learning. 
I, I enjoyed it. I loved the group lessons. I loved playing with the other kids. And the practice at home was not a love, which is what you see in most of my students as well. But then you hit an age where you absolutely love it. Something just clicks. I, I think it was going to see Itzhak Perlman with the Colorado Symphony, right. and that just blew my mind. So I think after that moment, I decided I love this and I want to become better. And then also introducing different styles. So fiddle and jazz and blues. And that's why I try to not just be a strict Suzuki teacher. I run that fiddle, a fiddle camp, which I gave you the website for, which I don't know if it's going to happen this summer, but apparently camps are possible. And the school I do it at said maybe, so we shall see about that. But yeah, introducing them to the different styles, but giving that basic background of the classical training, they can go anywhere. So, Is there a certain style that you are more, most drawn toward? I know you do a lot, and I don't want to, you know, is there one that challenges you still? Classical is my main. And I would say the challenge is jazz. It's tricky. Jazz theory, all that stuff, it just blows my mind. So, <laughs> yeah, it's very challenging to actually think about it. It's easier to just feel it and let it happen. I, I would agree. Like, if I... If if I contemplate what I'm doing, like with the right side of my brain and try to think about it, you completely lose it. Um, and normally it's, uh, it's stepping out of oneself, like, you know, in your uh, critiquing mode and, and, you know, your analytical side and just sort of like, I don't know, being fully present in it and the words come or the music comes, but I couldn't explain it as a process. It's, mm -hmm. it's really, it's beyond me and it's harder and harder to get into. I mean, I haven't done anything near that where I could get up and freestyle as it were in a long time. And I see people that do it all the time. Isaac and I used to go to uh, this show in, uh, in Oakland. Um, uh, oh, what was it called? Tourette's um, Without Regrets. Tourette's Without Regrets. And thank you very much. I knew you would know, <laughs> which was fantastic. And these, you'd see these young kids get up and they would do these rap battles and things. And it was all, improvised. Uh, I mean, I'm sure they had certain themes or whatever that they had explored, but it was mind-blowingly good. I was blown away by, and I'm like, you know, I've been hosting readings and doing these things, but it was always, you know, performed pieces, you know, memorized, etc., with very little riffing. And, um, and for some people, it's just so natural. And I was like, wow, that's, it's, it really is truly an art um, that, uh, I think the older I get, the more my mind is locked into certain positions and it's very uh, much harder for me to, to get out of that and let the words come. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm trying to teach my children to go for it now, you know, when they're young and let that improvisation come out. So I'm hoping that it will help them when they're older to just be able to do it. <laughs> do you have any adult students? You know, I have uh one right now whose daughter used to play and she went to high school and stopped playing and she said we have this violin here i really want to do it and she found me online through the suzuki website because her daughter had taken suzuki and she lives in tiburon so yes she's my adult student she's amazing she practices every day we're working through book one and yeah, she's great. But I did, I did have a group of them who were moms of students, and they get so busy. There's no time to practice, and so it's. I feel lucky to have one right now. <laughs> Talk to us about like where you were raised and how why you bounced around and why you ended up settling where you are. So I was born in Michigan, and that's where all my family is from. My dad got a job in Colorado, and we moved there when I was five to Denver and I grew up there and went to uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, studied violin there and then stayed for two years to study with William Starr to do Suzuki and he said I want you to go to grad school, you can either go to Denver University or you should go to the Hart School of Music. So I auditioned for both, 
got into both, had scholarships for both of them, and I chose to leave Colorado just to spread my wings and see how the East Coast was, and at the time I was dating a guy who had family in New York, so he moved with me to Connecticut, and then um, so that kind of made it more, a little more comfortable having someone who knew that area. And so I was there for two years. Him and I did not work out. And he moved back to Boulder. So I thought about going back to Colorado, but I, I felt like there was something more waiting for me. And my teacher, Linda Fiore, said, you know, where do you want to go? You have so many options here. You can go Chicago, you can go to Austin, you can go to LA, you can go to San Francisco. I mean, the big places where music was, because I didn't want to just teach, I wanted to be able to meet other musicians and perform, you know, and find bands and find, you know, orchestras to play in. And so I said, you know what, let's try San Francisco. So she made some phone calls, and the teacher at Dominican University had retired and they were looking for a new teacher. So I came here and interviewed, got the job. And here I am. <laughs> yeah, you, Michigan, Colorado, the Bay Area. Connecticut. <laughs> Connecticut. Uh, so to me, because I've been to all those places, I actually think that there's something that they all have in common, and they're also very different. Would you agree? What do you think they have in common? They ha what they have in common is more of a... Um, an innate love for nature is what's a part of all those places. Yeah? Yes. But the cultures of the people, uh, even though they might have that in common, are very different. So different. <laughs> yeah, I, I love California for sure. The East Coast was, was hard coming from Colorado. People are very different on the East Coast. And it's fast paced and yeah, it was different. I mean, I, I enjoyed it, but California is where I love to be. <laughs> I'm I, even though I'm not literally right there with you. I'm right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I miss California all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So all of these different places, these cultures and these trainings that you were giving were, were turning you into the person that you are. Mm -hmm. um, could you, could you talk a little bit about, how each of these places influenced you? So Colorado definitely was the Suzuki method being where the Suzuki Association of America is and having William Starr there. And I also met some people, that's where I first started in a rock band. I can't even remember who they were, but they found me and I, they had original songs and I played some shows with them and was super fun. <clears throat> and then going out east was mostly concentrating on classical. I didn't do any rock stuff out there. I mean, getting your master's degree is hard. It was a lot of work. I was practicing classical music, you know, eight hours a day. And then moving out here is where the whole rock stuff came along. I met, um, Mary Carey, who is in Southern Comfort, she's the lead guitarist, through a friend who said, you know, you two need to meet. I think you guys would create something really awesome. So she introduced us one night and we uh, played a little bit together and so we should create a band. Let's do it. So we came up with the name Southern Comfort. We had no other members. We um, made some phone calls because she's been in the industry for a long time and put together a band within a month and played Great American Music Hall. <laughs> we opened for Fleetwood Mask. Yeah, it was amazing. Wow, I did not but know that. That's awesome. I think Colorado teaching Connecticut was like my classical playing and then moving out here is fulfilling my dream of playing in rock bands. Could, could you re, could, could you reiterate? I don't know if there was a a, a thing with you know, a tongue twister or what. Did you say you opened for Fleetwood Mask, a Fleetwood Mac cover band, or that yeah. you opened for Fleetwood Mac? No, we didn't open. Okay. Fleetwood, <laughs> Mac. <laughs> Fleetwood, oh, okay. Mask, I, Fleetwood Mac cover band. <laughs> I totally heard Fleetwood Mac. I was like, wow. Oh no, wow. that would have been amazing. Stevie Nicks was my first concert 
uh, that I ever went to. I was eight years old. It was at Red Rocks, 1986, with my parents. Yeah, I'll never forget that concert. <laughs> Boy, that would have been something, though. I mean, if you, you meet a woman, you come up with a band name, a month later, you're opening this amazing place for Fleetwood Mac. Like, yeah, it just kind of <laughs> happened, you know? <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> After all of these experiences and travels, do you have a certain vision? Yeah, so my artistic vision is kind of, it was happening before all of this COVID-19. Everything was in place and just going perfectly. My studio was full, still is full, but the performing has not been happening. I had many, many gigs that were supposed to be coming up and we got a residency at the Seahorse here in Sausalito. We we're supposed to be playing once a month. So my artistic vision, I, I hope that it comes back that we can play together and perform together. And I love being concert master of my orchestra and I want to continue that. I hope that we can get back together. That's a group of older people so they're slightly worried a lot of them are you know teachers and retired and stuff and I'm hoping that comes back and I'm hoping my band figures out this online thing so I don't know I'm kind of living my artistic vision when I went to that Red Rocks concert I said to myself one day I'm gonna be playing on a stage like that so maybe one day I'll be playing Red Rocks with my band <laughs> Uh, I have very little doubt. Um, <laughs> uh, I would say that, you know, uh, something that you, you could also be doing right now, in, in addition to, you know, all of your copious amounts of free time with 40 kids, uh, is uh, uh, one thing you guys don't know and you haven't met yet, but you will be, uh, Isaac and Celine meeting uh, arguably next week, is a fellow friend and local uh, artist and poet is Joseph Auki, who uh, Julie routinely plays with um, when he does spoken word events mm -hmm. and uh, arguably it could be done remotely edited together with the music um, it doesn't require as much of a you know immediate um, uh, sound synchronization that you would need for like playing I, I do remember Joseph uh, we actually uh, we had drinks together a few times, what was the, uh, what I, one of the things I'm loving about this interview is hearing the name Smitty's and like stuff that's taking me back to, to the area. Joseph was actually the very first um, guest featured author and poet um, at the depot in Mill Valley when we brought back poetry readings. Joseph and I have actually talked about getting together. He wrote a new poem and I'm supposed to go over there or go somewhere and we're going to do that together. I'm going to play live violin behind him reading the, the poem. Fantastic. Yes. So we'll see when that happens. And so with the, with the situation that we are all in right now, um, you've been living your dream, living your, your, I guess what you're saying is that your lifestyle until recently, uh, living your dream has been your vision. Mm -hmm. So for myself, uh, there's a stir craziness, a feeling of being in a fog with being under quarantine and a stifling of creativity. However, as we're seeing, I think all of us are seeing that stifling is actually propelling us into being creative in other ways. So what are you doing with your creativity outside of uh, teaching your students right now? since you can't perform live? Well, I've been watching a lot of people doing the live performances. I attended a concert of a friend who put the show together. It was 10 minutes for each artist from all over the United States. I'm not sure how they did it. And they sold 100 tickets for $10 each, and it went on for two hours. So watching that was so motivating. And we're just trying to get my band online. So I'm, that's, I'm so inspired to make this happen. And I don't know if you guys have any ideas or know how to make it happen faster. It's been a struggle. Um, 
Yeah, and it's also being in the lockdown has been hard. I don't feel motivated as I did before seeing my musician friends and hanging out with them and playing with them. And it's kind of like, oh, I just, I miss them. I miss being with them. So it's that, been, it's been really hard actually. <laughs> yeah, there's a certain uh, kinetic um, electric energy yeah. when you're playing with people that you're very comfortable with or performing with. And I, I, I mean, surely we're all missing just the as, as social creatures, uh, being a, one, be able to touch other people, hug other people, et cetera. And furthermore, for performers and, and uh, brilliant artists such as yourself, the ability to interact with them on a performance level mm -hmm. is it's, it's got to be like, you know, having a limb amputated. It is. It's I, we're all missing each other so much. They they all want to get together. Um, we we're trying to do the online thing. We've talked about possibly getting together and playing six feet apart. I don't know. I've seen a few people doing that. So it's getting to the point where we just can't take it anymore. <laughs> but we're also trying to be safe. So. Celine, have you done any music with anyone? Uh, well, I've done a lot of Zoom meetings, uh, some like pedagogy, right? Like teaching adults and adult bands and um, teaching kids and some of them I think there's a falling off point right now where people are just teched out they really want the human touch and some things are starting to sort of reopen here not a lot um, but I've already had the question if I'm gonna have students in here mm -hmm. it's very hard to say yes there's so much unknown and that's that's I think the hard part I think that's also I'm very lucky reconnecting with you guys with Joshua and, and Isaac, uh, to be able to do this and to try to get artists together to just talk about how are we gonna do this? How, this might be how it is going forward. How can we do this and how can we work together to support one another in this new abnormal and see what we can do to inspire and, and help each other out, right? I would love to talk to you more about that. Yeah. You bet. I don't, yeah, I don't know where it's going either, and I'm hoping my fiddle camp will happen, but a lot of the families are scared, and they don't want to, and they, my partner, who teaches the art, is older, and she's not sure about it either, so. Yeah, we have less than one minute left. I just, I did want to say, uh, I really like the idea of getting together a whole bunch of different artists to either play a song or do something at the same time, even though it might have some little, you know, hiccups, I think that's a really worthwhile idea that we should consider. Okay, I'm down. Awesome. Okay. We're, about out of, we're about out of time. Thank so. you very much, Julie, for oh, being a part of it. Too. Thank this you, Isaac. Great. Thank you, Celine. Great to meet um, you guys. Good to see and you. And we look forward to seeing you again soon, love. Okay. Bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.